Okay, I think um, we can probably get started. Is that okay, Be Becky? I have, we've allowed enough time for people to come into the Zoom. Great. Well, um, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to those of you uh, in person here in the room and also welcome uh, to those uh, of us who are able to join by Zoom. Um, we have an enlightening and very engaging presentation ahead of us and I must admit, uh, this title is perhaps uh, the most intriguing titles um, I've seen, certainly of Dean's lectures and maybe of all lectures I've seen. So I'm really looking forward to um, uh, hearing um, from our uh, speaker. But before I do so, I would like to take a minute um, to recognize that uh, November is Native American Heritage Month, um, a time to pay homage to the first peoples of the lands on which we work and play. And so I thought I, we would take a minute, um, as we very often do at um, uh, school events, and uh, have a land acknowledgement, uh, recognition. Land recognition is just one way that we can appreciate the contributions and counter the, re the erasure of indigenous peoples in our society. We humbly acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of indigenous peoples. Our campus resides on unceded lands of the Piscataway and the Susquehannock peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of Cherokee community members. As we gather from places across this country and indeed across the world, we honor and recognize the indigenous people of our homelands. Together, we acknowledge the history of genocide, and ongoing systemic inequities while respecting treaties made on this territory as a step towards reconciliation and strengthening relationships and partnerships with indigenous peoples and their communities. We give thanks to the past, to the present, and the future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. We aim to hold ourselves as well as the university community accountable to tribal nations. The school's uh, Center for Indigenous Health is hosting a series of programs this month, so I hope you um, take advantage of those programs. And this includes um, an exhibit entitled Why Treaties Matter. And you can see this exhibit uh, in the atrium, and the atrium will be all after um, our, our uh, uh, talk today. We'll be gathering together in the atrium uh, for a reception, and you'll be able to engage uh, with this exhibit. So this is our second Dean's Lecture of the academic year. As we have all come to appreciate, I hope, this series uh, provides us with the opportunity to highlight the work of our newly appointed and promoted professors and senior scientists. These lectures are an incredible opportunity for us to hear from people who are truly leaders in their fields. We get to learn firsthand how they are impacting uh, the the um, uh, impacting lives through their research, their practice, as well as their education and public health. And today I am particularly pleased to welcome Michael Rosenblum, a biostatistician who is at the forefront of causal inference. Dr. Rosenblum has a particular focus on innovative clinical trial design and analysis, and he's a leading expert on adaptive trial design. He has impacted both the theory as well as the practice by implementing groundbreaking tools and collaborating closely with um, uh, FDA. Michael came to public health in a bit of a sideways um, after uh, earning his PhD in applied math from MIT. He was looking for a way to connect his background to something that was helpful to society, which I'm sure is no surprise to anybody who knows him well. Through a Bloomberg School summer course on humanitarian emergencies, Michael got his first test of taste of public health. He would go on to undertake postdoc work in biostatistics at the University of California at Berkeley and at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. In 2009, he joined our school here uh, in Baltimore. And ever since he has been busy finding innovative ways to achieve his original goal, and that is to improve society through the power of math and statistics. As many of you know, I'm trained as a biostatistician, albeit many years ago, and I came to this field for similar reasons. So I'm particularly delighted to hear that, that Michael um, 
uh, will be addressing us today. And while I could get somewhat technical in introducing his research, I'll keep it at a very high level um, and I'll leave the details to Michael. Simply put, Michael is uh, helping to uncover which treatments work best for which people. A specific passion of his is covariate adjustment to improve precision in clinical trials. This underutilized statistical method can be applied in many disease areas and can substantially reduce the required number of participants in any given trial. Covariate adjustment saves time and money, and at the same time can save people from undergoing unnecessary experimental care. Seems like a win-win. And with funding from the FDA, Michael is creating free online tutorials on how to implement this approach and is a very enthusiastic advocate, advocate for its widespread use in clinical trials. Trial design and analysis may be his area of academic focus, but Michael continues to find new avenues to make a difference using his expertise. Just this year, he authored an amicus brief for a murder trial uh, at Mar Maryland's highest court. This effort came at the request of the public defender and raises important questions about the accuracy of firearm forensics. When we look at the span of Michael's work, it's clear how passionate he is about ensuring health equity, the cornerstone of our work in public health. Just to give a few examples, here at the Bloomberg School, he co-developed a service learning course where students partner with community-based organizations in Baltimore and support their data needs. He is also one of the leaders at the university's 100% Democracy Data Science Hackathon. This initiative gave students the opportunity to create a community voter heat map to help the League of Women Voters. In addition, he is extremely passionate about increasing the use of solar power right here in Maryland. And he has written about this for the Baltimore Sun, and I think he'll mention uh, some of that work today. And as many of you know, Michael is also the department's associate chair for IDARE. He is committed to elevating inclusion, diversity, anti-racism, and equity, and is known for being a fierce advocate for social justice. Michael is also exceptionally dedicated, an exceptionally dedicated educator, and has been recognized by, by the Bloomberg School many times over for his excellence in teaching. He consistently advocates for his students and is a pillar in the doctoral teaching program at the department. In sum, Dr. Rosenblum cares very deeply about building a better department, a better school, and a better world, a fact that shines through every day in his work and his actions. Michael, welcome, and I will give the floor to you. We're so excited to hear from you today. Okay. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, and it's wonderful to see all of you here today. And thank you for joining by Zoom as well. I wanted to start by showing this is the certificate. Um, if you could zoom in there uh, on the certificate. The, so this is what I received in 2002, 20 years ago, when I was a PhD student in math um, at, you know, in, um, at MIT. And the, it's a certificate for completing the health course, health emergencies in large populations. And that's now taught by the Center uh, for Humanitarian Health here. And that, that really pulled me into public health and uh, got me excited about it and has really steered my career uh, in this direction. So I'll, I'll be talking about two almost free lunches, one in statistics and one in fighting climate catastrophe. Uh, before I do that, I think it needs uh, maybe I just need to put the focus on there. Okay. Great. The uh, before I do that, I just wanted to dedicate this talk to the two people um, who I care most about and are most important in my life, to our uh, to Sachini Bandara, um, who's all she is a assistant professor in the mental health department here, and to Ashan, um, so uh, our five year old, who is uh, also a jellyfish. Um, and also good to striking a post. So the outline, the dean um, kindly gave the uh, land acknowledgement. So I'll talk about two free lunches first, community solar and covariate adjustment 
in randomized trials. Then I'll briefly talk about forensic firearms analysis, Baltimore community data science, and some collaborations with the SNF Agora Institute, which is part of Johns Hopkins. And as always, you have to, I have to give a disclosure. These are, the opinions are mine, not anyone else's, not the FDA, uh, not Johns Hopkins. So we have the, so the first thing I wanna talk about is community solar. And the, the story is that I, about four years ago, I thought to myself, I'd like to get my home electricity from renewable sources. Um, and I, I was very cocky about it. And I thought I should be able to go on the internet, you know, I'm, and look for about half an hour, figure out what's the best option if there is one and sign up. So I started doing that. And then I realized after half an hour, this is much more complicated. Uh, there's a deregulated electricity market in Maryland. So, and then I thought, all right, another half an hour that can actually solve this. And I eventually spent over the next few months, about 40 or 50 hours, just getting sucked into this and talking to different people, making phone calls and trying to figure out what's the best option. And eventually landed on, a, I think, a, a, an excellent option, um, which is called Community Soul. And I'm extremely passionate about spreading the word on this. The, uh, so our five-year-old son, Ashan, when, he, when he's going to bed, when he's I'm about to close the door and say goodnight, uh, and he's trying to draw out the um, bedtime routine, they'll say, Papa, Papa, tell me about community solar. Tell me about community solar. He knows I can't resist uh, talking about it. And so the, what is community solar? And actually, I'm going to ask all of you who are here today and everyone joining by Zoom, um, I'm going to ask you to do something uh, during the talk uh, related to this. Um, if, you know, it's optional, of course. But um, so this is a, an article. Uh, it's an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun from back in May. And this is... Uh, Co-op, myself and Julian Goresco, who's the director of sustainability at Johns Hopkins, also a community solar advocate. This is the, uh, in leading up to this, that this is the part of the solar project that Sachini, Ashan, and I subscribe to. It's in White Marsh. We don't live in White Marsh area, but this is um, a big solar array that got built somewhat recently in White Marsh that we are connected to. So what, what is this community solar and why? Why is it a free lunch? So community solar, it allows you to get the environmental benefits of getting your home electricity from solar, but without installing anything at your house. Now, if you want to install something at your house, I would say, great. I, mean, I would never say not to. But sometimes that's not possible, or you're a renter, for example, or your house configuration is not ideal. Um, so this gets you roughly the equivalent benefits um, in terms of cutting your carbon footprint. Um, but nothing changes at your home. Uh, what you do if you sign up for Community Solar is you subscribe to a portion, an allocation of the power generated by a solar project that's built on unused land in the BGE area. And actually, you can do this all across Maryland. Um, but for I'll focus on BGE um, here. And anyone who pays a BGE bill can is eligible for this. Um, and the only thing that, as a consumer, the only change in your life is you get um, a credit on your electricity bill. Actually, I can show you my bill. Um, so it, I won't spend a lot of time on my electric bill, but this is the, and I blacked out some parts, uh, especially my electric choice ID number, which scammers will always try to, well, uh, well that's, that's everything. But the, um, the, but I just want to highlight it this one part, which is the credit. It says other charges and credits, but it's a solar credit so that it's subtracted off your bill. Um, and the way this is set up is that it, it's subsidized. It's a, a program run by the state of Maryland based on 2015 legislation. And you're guaranteed to save 10% uh, on your electricity supply portion of your uh, BGE bill every month. So they don't change your rates. They can't control your rates. They're just you're getting 10% less uh, than whatever BGE rate is. Um, a key point, which is maybe the biggest challenge for community solar, is it's not a scam. So that was my biggest question going into this. It, am I going to get scammed? I don't like to get scammed. And uh, and actually, Ashan was very wondering, like, is he going to get scammed? One of his biggest worries when he was three years old is, am I going to get scammed? <laughs> so I was like, you're not going to worry. <laughs> that won't happen to you. 
but that because uh, you heard me talk about this, but that th there are electricity related scams out there. People knocking on your door asking you to don't ever tell them anything if that happens. But this is completely separate. And I, I did a lot of research into has there, you know, is, is any of this a scam in community solar? And it's not. Um, and I can I can personally vouch for it. I, I use this. I've been a customer for about four years. I have many friends and colleagues and family who use it and are everyone's happy with it, uh, who I know. And I don't make any money off of this. I'm not, uh, this is not some kind of pyramid scheme or something. The, um, and so my, there's really no downside to it. Uh, so this is a, a true free lunch. And what I'd like to ask you to do is if you're interested to um, just send me an email now, um, I'm not, I'm not going to sign you up. Uh, I'm just going to send you information uh, if you'd like to learn about it. And I can send you the link if you want to sign up, but it's, it's essentially a no-brainer, um, and I, I can see people in this room who I know who are, are, are users of it already. Um, so, wow. it's, so it's not going to doesn't solve the climate crisis, but it's it, it does cut your. I did a calculation of one of those online calculators for what it's worth of how much that impacts my uh, our um, carbon footprint, and it cuts it by about ten percent. So it's not trivial, and that's is you know forever essentially as long as you're in BGE territory. Even if you move, it can move with you if you like. Okay, so let me move on from that. Oh, and let me tell about, I wanna sing some praises of Julian Goresco, the Director of Sustainability at Johns Hopkins. Um, so he has an idea that he's working on um, to make community solar easily available to um, Hopkins, to all Hopkins employees. So it's just, it's kind of hard to figure out where do I go to sign up? How, how do you do it? And um, the, so he's working with talking to different computer, um, different community solar companies and to, to find what is the best deal for a carve out at, on a particular um, solar project that can be just for Hopkins employees. And then the, um, working on a campaign to raise awareness about this, give incentives, companies compete and they can give incentives for doing it. And I, one very important thing in, in terms of um, another great thing about community solar is if your income is below, your household income is below a certain threshold, then you qualify for getting a bigger discount on your electric bill. So if your household income is less than 69,650 per year, that's the current threshold, then in your BGE territory, then uh, you get a 25% discount on your electric supply bill every month. So, um, so Julian is helping to spread the word on that. So that's free lunch number one. Um, free lunch number two is completely different. Nothing to do with solar. Um, the it's it has to do with um, clinical trials and my research on clinical trials. And so that um, Dean McKenzie did a great job explaining what it was. I in a sense I I can skip this whole part. But the um, but I'll, but I'll just say that the goal is to improve the statistical the design and the statistical analysis of clinical trials, and we the idea is to have a, a method that applies to many many trials. There are thousands of uh, confirmatory clinical trials going on at any moment, and the the goal is to improve develop improved statistical methods to um, extract the most information from the data in a trial, uh, but not make any more assumptions with under no additional assumptions. Um, and the, the idea is relatively simple and I did not invent this in any way. This goes back at least 20 years, um, 21 years to a, a paper by Yang and Ciadis in 2001. Um, and the idea is that if baseline variables are, baseline variables are things measured before randomization at the very beginning when someone enters a trial, things like disease severity, age, sex, many, many things are measured. And if, some of those variables are correlated with the outcome, whatever you're measuring in the trial. It could be, you know, does, does someone recover in a certain amount of time from COVID um, in a COVID trial? Uh, if you have correlations, then um, appropriately adjusting for chance imbalances between the control arm and the treatment arm in these variables, that can lead to reductions in the variance. In, in, you could say increases in the precision of estimating the average treatment effect. Um, and the upshot is you can get smaller sample sizes and shorter trial duration, which allows you to learn whether a treatment works or not more quickly. 
Um, so, you, you know, it's, um, and the nice thing is there's no cost. It doesn't, in fact, you're going to say, typically you would save uh, potentially a lot. Um, you're just changing the analysis at the end of the trial. Um, so the problem uh, that I'm kind of constantly trying to push on is, and work against is that covariate adjustment is highly underutilized, especially for binary ordinal and time to event outcomes. So these are outcomes that are common in clinical trials. Um, the, and there's some surveys of trials that, that show this. And so, so what I, my research group, what we try to work on is developing new statistical methods to handle um, these kinds of outcomes. You know, we're, again, we didn't invent this. There are methods existing for those, but we have methods that are um, robust to um, additional assumptions or robust to misspecified models. That, that's, I'll say that. Um, and, and this is, uh, and we also try to disseminate the methods through open source software to implement them, to make it easy to do, and through courses um, and workshops. And also the FDA has funded us to do online tutorials of how to do this. Um, so I love, it's one of my favorite topics, just like community solar to talk about this. Um, and I'll, I'll just go very quickly through this slide, which is there've been surveys of clin clinical trial reports where a researcher, so Pocock et al. in 2002, they surveyed 50 randomized trials. They took randomly selected 50 trial reports from top medical journals. And they looked at how often, they looked at, well, what are people doing? What, you know, are they adjusting or not? And they found that the statistical emphasis on covariate adjustment is quite complex and often poorly understood. And there remains confusion as to what's an appropriate statistical strategy. Austin et al. in 2010 did essentially the same thing and found the same thing. Yep. Um, and you might ask, well, is it the FDA's fault? Um, does the FDA give mixed messages about it or do they say not to do it? In fact, no. Um, the FDA, if anything, is encourages people to do it. Now, I don't speak for the FDA. I get in big trouble if uh, somehow that came across. But the um, but the FDA. So going back to 1998, one of their foundational documents of how to analyze data from clinical trials. There's this quote that pretrial deliberations should identify those covariates and factors expected to have an important influence on the primary variables and should consider how to account for these in the analysis to improve precision. They're essentially saying you should do covariate adjustment if you have baseline variables correlated with that. So that, that was from 1998. Fast forward to 2020 when, um, you know, March and April 2020, the, so the FDA reached out to uh, several universities so that our, we have something, this is led by Caleb Alexander, which I, and I really appreciate. Um, it's, it's called a Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, a CIRCI. Um, and that facilitates connections. It does a lot of things, but it facilitates connections with the FDA. The FDA is just 40 minute drive from here, by the way. So it's um, easy to collaborate. And through that, they, the FDA reached out to statisticians and said, um, you know, we, there are a huge number of COVID treatment trials that are coming down the the pipeline, you know, just in the first couple of months of uh, in March and April 2020. And we want, can you please give advice on what are appropriate trial designs to, to handle this uh, for COVID trials? And so um, myself and uh, collaborators, we wrote, wrote up, we did some simulation studies based on very early COVID data from hospitals. And we found that you should really, I'll just summarize that, that um, we found you can get big improvements by adjusting for baseline variables. And probably everyone in this room knows, could name a few variables that are correlated with, that are predicting bad outcomes. Um, if, you, if you're COVID positive, you know, age, older age, comorbidities that, you know, that, and that was known at the very beginning. Um, and then the FDA a month later, they put out a guidance document. So we, we, we wrote this in a report sent to the FDA and in April 2020 and in May 2020, they came out with a guidance that I'll just, that has this quote at the bottom. Um, essentially, they're saying you should consider using covariate adjustment. Um, so what they said exactly aligned with our recommendations. So I was super happy about that. Um, and there, there's another guidance in 20, uh, 2011 that the FDA put out. I'm not citing here, 
There's a draft guidance on covariate adjustment for all trials, essentially of drugs and biologics. And that also is recommending to consider covariate adjustment. So this is not something, it's something with active research, even though the idea has been around a long time. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and the, the reason I'm really excited about it is that if the benefit was just reducing the sample size by 1% or 2% from doing this, I would say, yeah, still do it. It's free. It's very easy. Why would you not want to do that? But I would not be giving a talk about it. I wouldn't be caring so much. But the, the benefits can be, it depends on the context, but the benefits can be enormous. So just for some examples, I have uh, I've collected lots of clinical trial data sets from completed clinical trials. And in six example ones, you can look at the data from a completed trial and estimate how much could you have improved if you adjusted for baseline variables, how much could you have shrunk the sample size and still had the same power. So in a, for an Alzheimer's disease trial, uh, you get a 25%, these are estimates, but the 25% of reduction in sample size, cardiac resyn resynchronization device trial for treating heart failure, the 19% reduction for a depression treatment trial, 24% reduction, HIV trial, 2% reduction, schizophrenia trial, 4% reduction, and then stroke trial, 25% reduction. So it's, kind of, it's a little bit all over the place. Sometimes the benefit is small, just two or 4%. Um, but sometimes it's enormous, like 25% reduction in sample size. It, trials, these are confirmatory trials. They're typically costing 10 million or more. Um, and if you can shrink that by a quarter, um, and also you shrink the time as well to find out the answer. So the, you, sometimes the impact can be big and you can figure it out beforehand roughly how much gain you're going to get. Um, so it's, that, that's why I think that's underappreciated how big the gains can be. Of course, it depends on the context a lot. So you need prior data to investigate. Um, yeah, the improvement is highly, it is directly connected to how correlated the baseline variables are with the outcome. So I, I mean, if you go to rosenbloom.jhu.edu, we have open source software implementing covariate adjustment, some new methods that give some improvements on it. Um, Short, course and short courses and workshops, the recordings from it and materials from that. And some ongoing work is, this is funded by the uh, Bill and Mel Melinda Gates Foundation, creating free, a free course um, for training statisticians in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a partnership with the Sub-Saharan Africa Consortium for Advanced Biostatistics. And in future work, I'd, I'd like to create a, a center, uh, a training program or in clinical trial statistics, not just covert adjustment, but the bigger picture of um, design and analysis of trials. Now, the, the talk is not over, but I wanted to give some uh, thank yous in the middle of the talk. Um, I just wanna make sure it doesn't get squeezed at the end of the time. So I wanted to give some thank yous to um, here to colleagues uh, and postdocs and students of mine. So first, um, I, I put a big picture, I thought, I just didn't have space to put pictures of everybody. So I picked one person, um, Josh Betts, who gets to be, who's uh, at the center. But he, I mean, he is amazing. Josh Betts, he's in our consulting center, the Biostatistics Consulting Center. Um, he's brilliant. And just that he has been a longtime collaborator of mine on many, many projects and just has done a fantastic job. So I, I just want to give him um, a shout out and appreciation. Um, also, other colleagues in the department, Elizabeth Contuoni, Adi German, and uh, Jeff Leek. Uh, we've worked together on some on covariate adjustment. Uh, also, my former postdocs, Kelly Van Lanker, Yvonne Diaz, Jon Steingrimson, Terry Rose, and Roy Adams. Um, they've all moved on to um, higher positions, that, uh, but they all made big contributions in this. And then my former PhD students, they've also made big contributions. So they. Um, Tian Chen Kian, Yu Du, Bing Kai Wang, Emily Huang, Prasad Patil, Aaron Fisher, Claire Ruberman, and Yu Chen uh, Yang. So they're some are at FDA now uh, of the students, some are at uh, pharma companies, some are professors, assistant professors. Okay. Um, so the, the next topic, completely different, not completely, but mostly different. From what I was talking about before, it's about clinical trials, but not covariate adjustment. Covariate adjustment applies to any, essentially any kind of trial, any disease area. Adaptive trial designs, which is 
something I focus on. Um, it's a, a little bit different. And so I, just to give a sense of why people are interested in adaptive designs, this is a, one, another line of research that I work on. So this is a news newsletter called the Clinical Trials Advisor. And this is back in 2009. Actually, Karen Van Dien Roche uh, sent me this uh, back right when I joined. It was right next to me. I joined Hawkins. And the headline is Adaptive Trial Design Save Merck Millions. And the first line, I blew it up here at the bottom, it says, an adaptive clinical trial conducted by Merck saved the company 70.8 million compared with what a hypothetical traditionally designed study would have cost. And it's not true. It's false. Um, that uh, it really should have said, but when I saw it, I thought that's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. Um, or, or what's going on there? How could that, you know, most trials don't cost that much money. Some do, but most trials don't cost even that total. So the, I looked into it. It really should have said a hypothetical adaptive trial. They basically did simulations. And they did, what if we had used an adaptive design instead of the actual design that got used? What would have happened um, in, the, in their simulation? Uh, I'm not against that idea, but it's just misreported here. Uh, in the simulation study, uh, they, they showed that they could save 70.8 million. Now, any ideas from the audience on uh, how, how did they get to that high amount of money? Like, how could they have, if you're with the company Merck, how, how could they have saved up, gotten that much extra money with an adaptive design? You just have to guess. I mean, there's no way you can know. It, so that's one uh, one hypothesis. That that's what I also thought of first. Is it just there are really expensive trials where if you cut down the sample size or. Um, but it turns out that's not the case. I mean, that's a good. That's what I thought first too. Did someone else say? Yeah, yeah. Sample size. Well, it's so. Any other ideas? Maybe one more. The upper limit of uncertainty. Okay, so it, it confidence interval. Huh? So that that's also a good um, a good guess. It turns out that so this is by Merck, the pharma company Merck, and they said that an adaptive design would have stopped and concluded that the treatment works two months before the standard design would have. And two months from the Merck point of view, uh, if it's a blockbuster drug, two months of revenue off selling uh, a blockbuster drug gets you 70.8 million. Um, and that's, you know, you have a patent clock. And if you, you know, two more months on the patent clock, you get that much money. So, you know, I'm, I don't work for any pharma companies um, um, or, but uh, but that was their analysis, and I, I presented this at uh, a workshop on trial designs, improved trial designs for antiretroviral uh, drugs, new antiretrovirals. And I said, I hope no one here is from Merck. I hope I didn't offend anyone. And the next speaker was from Merck, and it was like it wasn't a secret who the speaker it was on the. You know, I just didn't look. Uh, so, and then afterwards, I apologized to him and I said, I'm sorry if you know. I, I actually, there's nothing bad. About about Merck here, it's just that the the news report was a, was a little bit wrong. Um, and he said, actually, this is anecdotal. I just want to, but he said, actually, this is a long. I just want to put it. This is in 2009. He's the the Merck uh, person said that if you don't propose an adaptive feature on your trial design, you have to say why not, which is exactly the opposite of how it should be. So, but there's there was a lot of hype. I mean, there still is some hype about what it can do. Um, but I want to say adaptive designs, unfortunately, are not a free lunch. It's all about trade-offs. So there are potential benefits of adaptive designs. Uh, you Sometimes you, they can give more power to confirm an effective treatment or intervention. Um, and they, what I really like about them is they can potentially help you learn who benefits from a treatment. They you can help steer you to subpopulations who benefit the most. Um, but I just want to give a caution that adaptive is not always better. Um, sometimes people, their knee-jerk reaction is, let's try adaptive. I've had people come to me and say, I want to do an adaptive design for this trial. And I do simulations and I say, that's a bad idea. Just do a simple standard design. 
and they say, no, no, I want to do adaptive. I'm like, don't, don't do it, don't do it. So that, um, because they're trade-offs and the challenge is finding, in general, is finding the best design tailored to the specific problem that they're addressing and your context um, and also your resource constraints. You know, you only have a certain amount of money, time, uh, participants who you can enroll. And so what uh, I worked on was, I'll just cut through this to, uh, developing new adaptive enrichment designs. It's designs where you can um, change enrollment criteria as you learn which participants, which subpopulations might benefit more or less from treatment. Um, develop some new adaptive designs. And the key thing, that what I'm most excited about is number two here, developing user-friendly, free open source software that will search for you over many different types of trial designs. You input, you tell, what are my resource constraints? You know, what sample size, what trial duration? Um, and then you tell what your scientific goals are. And this will optimize for you. It runs an optimization algorithm to try to find the best adaptive designs and the best standard designs. And then it shows you, it's an automatically generated report, which tells you, here's the trade. -off. It's always a trade. -off. Sometimes it's a favorable one. You might say, oh, that's worth it. Um, or you might say, no, that's not worth it. So that, and you can decide. Um, and then we also demonstrate in clinical applications. And this is, again, this is at rosenblum.jhu.edu. So let me go to something completely different, which is forensics firearms examination. The, the idea of the talk is just to give a little, little snippet of things. If you ask questions or wants to talk about collaborations, I would love to, and we, we can tell more, but I just want to give a sense of what I work on. So the, uh, I'm going to come back to this, but this, these are images from a paper by uh, Matichson et al. in 2020, and there are three pairs of images. And you can take a look at the first pair. Um, this is this is a microscopic. It's a snapshot using a microscope of. Uh, it's from a cartridge case. These cartridge cases from fired bullets. And <clears throat> excuse me, it's it's a very tiny part and near the pin aperture. Is what it's called, and they zoom in, and these are from two cartridge cases, and they take pictures. And the question is, are were those bullets are were the bullets from the same gun or different guns? Can you and so you have a cartridge case, two cartridge cases, and you want to answer did did they result from firing from the same gun or different guns? Um, you have three pairs here, so I'll talk about this in a minute. That's the idea. And so this, the origin of this is that the Maryland Office of Public Defender, they reached out, they actually reached out to Josh Betts in our Biostat Center and said they're looking for, um, they're looking for a statistician who knows nothing about firearms examination to evaluate the scientific validity of firearm, of forensic firearms examination. And I said, and Josh told me about it, and I said, I'm, I'm interested to learn about this. I know nothing about that at all. Um, and the reason the reason the public defender's office was interested to, to have this evaluation is that they said the state or the prosecution would often bring in um, a, forensics, uh, a forensic firearms examiner who would make claims about um, a whether a cartridge case found at a crime scene matches a cartridge case fired from the defendant's gun. They do test fires from a defendant's gun. They look at them, the two cartridge cases under a microscope, and the firearms examiner makes a claim about, yes, they came from the same gun, or no, they didn't, or I don't know. And they claim they're very accurate in this. And so they wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they wanted to know, you know, what, what do we think? And they were looking for scientists to weigh in. And I'll just mention that Arturo Casadevall, he has been involved in this. I later found out. I'll, I'll mention him in a bit. Um, but the the overall topic of firearms, uh, forensic firearms examination, it's a subjective method. So there's not like a certain list of criteria that you have to check this. or um, It's a subjective method to assess whether two bullets or two cartridge cases, that's what falls out after you shoot the bullet, um, if they were fired from the same same gun or different guns, and it's not just the same type of gun, it's the same gun, that gun and no other gun. Um, and the idea is to compare striation patterns under a microscope. 
And it's, used, it's been used as evidence in courts for about 100 years. And the question is, is it scientifically valid? And you might be able to guess that it's not scientifically valid. That, um, or at least it has, that, that it's not been demonstrated to be scientifically valid. It's, a, it's a kind of an open question. What, um, so that, so, it, but this goes back, I'm not the first person to look into this and see this. This has been known for a long time. And at least since 2009, uh, National Academies report was put out on this. And more recently in 2016, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, it's called a, for short, PCAST, they put out a report and they looked at um, a variety of feature comparison methods. So fingerprints, DNA, hair analysis, uh, there, there are a bunch more. And so, and this, Arturo Casadevall was an author on this, this 2016 report. Um, and essentially the, so this is a quote about firearms examination in particular. And it says that the early studies indicate that examiners can, under some circumstances, associate ammunition with the gun from which it was fired. However, most of these studies involve designs that are not appropriate for assessing scientific validity or estimating the reliability um, of the method as practiced. I'll just stop at that point. Um, and the problems were, were, were with the study design and they tended to, I'll give, I'll list a few of the problems in a moment, but they tended to underestimate the error rate. Um, and again, this is, uh, a lot of this is not connected to me. This is just what I discovered in reading papers about this and read, I, I read the, all the studies. There are a lot of studies. Um, and, but, but some of the, but none of them is well designed. Um, and, there, there are lists, I won't go through all the, the problems in it, but I'll just highlight a few. So the first is that a firearms examiner, when they look at a pair, so let me just go back to the to this. So basically you get, there, there are studies where the firearms examiners get tested. Um, they're randomly given two cartridge cases um, and where the, the experimenter, the person running all this, they know if it was from the same gun or different guns. And they ask the firearms examiner, same or different. And so like, here are two, there's three pairs here. Uh, these are the images that they, they look at. And, and so the firearms examiner can answer that it's a match from the same gun, that it's not a match, it's from different guns, or inconclusive. They don't know, which is fine. They should be able to say that. But... In these, in these experiments, whenever an examiner says inconclusive, that's marked as correct. They got it right. And they answer that in some of the studies, it's like half the time they say inconclusive. It's not like a tiny amount of time. So basically when they say we have a really low error rate, it's, it's that that's when you count inconclusive as correct every time. It's kind of like saying, you know, here, you, here's a test you can take. And if you don't feel like answering a question, maybe it's hard, just don't answer it. And you get it right automatically, and uh, and we'll see how well you do. And so it's, like, it's kind of a ridiculous idea. Um, so it's again, I'm not against firearms examiners saying inconclusive. In or they might really not know, but you can't count it as correct in these investigations of uh, error rates. You know, you shouldn't. That's not right. So that I mean, other, again, I'm not the one who pointed this out. Others have. And there's also issues with lack of repeatability. I'll just mention that one. Um, so there's a study by Ames Research Labs um, where they they would send um, a bunch of pairs of cartridge cases for, uh, fired from different or same guns to examiners. The firearms examiners would say if they're match or not or inconclusive, mail them back. And a couple of months later, they would, their examiners would get a new set to, to try to determine um, same, different, or inconclusive. And they knew ahead of time that they're going to get the same. Sometimes they're going to get the same pair as they saw the first round. Um, and so, and the question is, how often does the same person, given exactly the same pair of cartridge cases, say the same thing? That's the repeatability question. It's not like different examiners, but the same person. 
And depending on the kind of comparison they're doing, there's some caveats, but it, it was roughly between 20 and 40% of the time they disagreed with themselves. Usually it's making something inconclusive before they said it's the same, but and then next time they say it's inconclusive, but the but it's like it's still that's uh, kind of shockingly high for me anyway. Uh, lack of repeatability. There are a bunch of other problems, and that um, and so the end. So I, I co-authored an amicus brief. This is with the public defender's office for this a murder case that it's um, being reviewed at Maryland's highest court. And the and also I want to mention Arturo Casadevall. He's a co-author. There are many people on this. Um, and um, I'll likely testify as an expert witness, not in this case, but in some upcoming cases, if if there's a need. I'm, now that I've absorbed all this, I, I want to, anyway, I, I offered to do that if they want. And I'm also working with uh, Maria Coelar, who's, she's a real expert on this. So she does forensic statistical uh, methods and she's at Penn. And she and I found some new problems with the, the studies that we're writing a, a paper on. Um, Okay, so in the last, I'm going to go very quickly in about two minutes through the uh, the last bits here, so we can have time for questions. But I just wanted to mention that um, it, it's been an honor to be working with Carrie Wright and Ava Hoffman. So they're two um, two researchers uh, in the data. They used to be in the data science lab at Hopkins. They've since moved to become um, assistant professors in the uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute, but they're still in Baltimore. So they still, we, we still may be putting this on this coming spring, a, a new course called Baltimore Community Data Science, where we collaborate with partners um, in the community to work on their data science problems. And this is through SOURCE, uh, supported by the SOURCE Service Learning Faculty Fellows Program. So if you haven't heard of this Faculty Fellows Program, I, I highly recommend to check it out. It's amazing. I learned so much from uh, Mindy Levin, Tyler Dareth. They really helped create this course. Um, so I, um, and this is, I should have mentioned, the top picture is Terry Wright and the bottom is Ava Hoffman. They're the ones who really led the course. Um, I won't tell too much about the course, but you can go to the website at the bottom um, or email me. But we worked with, I'll just say we worked with Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition, um, Heart Smiles, which involves youth leadership and empowerment, and also the No Boundaries Coalition. Uh, on health and food justice. I'll just skip over this part. Um, and I, I'm going to skip this one too and just talk about, um, I, I just wanted to mention one of the things that Johns Hopkins I'm most excited about is the SNF Agora Institute. Um, so their goals, this is some of their goals. I'm probably butchered it. I'm not, you know, don't uh, quote me on it, but you can go to their website, they'll tell it better. But I tried to shrink it down to as, small as I could get. So their goals are understand democratic decline and resilience and identify possible interventions and collaborate with practitioners. They're very practice focused um, to test practical interventions and translate academic research into usable knowledge for the world. So, you know, it's if you can look at any newspaper and the, the headline and it's going to involve exactly this uh, issue. So extremely timely and very much aligned with public health. You know, if, if these Democratic decline is also going to potentially correlate with uh, declines in other in public health. So, the uh, so I just wanted to make a pitch for reaching out to uh, and connecting with the SNF Agora Institute. I'm going to start doing some uh, happy hours. This is something that Hari Han. Oh, this is a picture of Hari Han. She's the uh, the director, and she is she's amazing. She's like, uh, um, uh, and uh, and she and Sam Novi, who led the 100% data. 100% democracy data science hackathon that we talked about putting together happy hours where people from school of public health and from SNF Agora get together and talk about research ideas. Um, we have someone, a good representative here uh, from uh, as well. Um, and the, um, let me just cut to thank yous. And so I, I wanted to, there's too many people to thank. I apologize if I leave any leave people out, I inevitably will. But I wanted to give special thanks to um, to my department mentors. So it's, uh, who have, who have really, um, uh, I, I can't express how appreciative I am. They really have helped me in so many ways that Scott Zeger is in the middle here uh, to his left. 
to the left of him is Tom Lewis. If you're looking at these to the left, and Karen Bendy and Roche on the the far left, um, all have been amazing mentors to me. They just taught me so much of what I know and and pushed me in good directions. I also want to thank um, our department staff. I think staff often get underappreciated, um, and they're they're very much unsung heroes. I mean, they're making everything work. Uh, so Nanette Bell, Tara Schoenberg, Marty Gilbert, Mary Joy Argo, uh, Emily Vogelin, Dan Wentland, Fallon Bachman, and Maria Beeson. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Tanya Carroll. Her picture is on the far right here. Uh, so she's in facilities management here, and she, you know, her she is right across from my office. I see her essentially every day. You know, she she cleans our offices and the the area around us. Um, and she's an amazing person as well. Um, and I want to thank my past mentors, Mark Vanderland, who's pictured here on the second from the right, um, and Nick Jewell. Uh, this is when I was at Berkeley. They really, really transformed the direction of um, of my career, and my life. And I also wanted to thank my um, my family. So the highest thanks is to uh, Sachini Bandara, um, who I, I would be nothing without, and um, who yeah, just. Uh, every day I'm amazed at, at what she is doing. Um, and I already said our, our thanks to our jellyfish, Ashan, and this is our, my extended family, including, um, I'll just point out my brother, John, who's in the audience here uh, today, um, there, um, who I also extremely appreciate, um, has done so much to support me. And also uh, Satini's family, um, her parents and sisters, um, who also are, Amazing and, and really have made, yeah. I also would be nothing without them. Um, and so I'd, I'll stop there, but I just want to, you know, thank everyone in the school for making, uh, for really supporting uh, my career. And I, yeah, I'm very appreciative. Thanks. Well, that was fantastic. It lived up to all the hype with, the, uh, with your title. It was great. Yeah. But if you have a question, um, if you would just um, uh, send a question to Let's say, Becky, I have a question. Um, and then we'll call on you so that you can um, uh, ask your question online. But maybe while those of you online are typing your questions furiously, maybe I'll open it up to those of you in this room. Yes. Great. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. What do you have? It, it it's a great question. I'll just repeat the question. That um, could you have essentially the firearms examiner in a court case have to compare the um, test shots from a uh, defendant's gun against not just the crime scene uh, cartridge case, but many other cartridge cases, and maybe many other guns as well. Uh, and try to say what, and then you get a sense of what the error rate would be. Um, and, and actually that, it's a great suggestion. And uh, the, there are, there, I think there's one or two trial uh, experiments where they do something like that, where they basically have a, an, it's not exactly that, but along those lines. And in those, 
they see that the error rates tend to be higher, like an order of magnitude higher than in the, the studies where they say it's less than 1%. So that, um, yeah, it's a really good idea. It also points to something um, I didn't mention from the PCAST report, which is that they also said, you, you don't just need to demonstrate scientific validity. There should be some proficiency testing for firearms examiners that's public. You should be able to see what their score is. You know, that does not exist. So it's uh, that's another issue that you don't really know for your particular examiner, even in principle, how you know how, how accurate they are. But yeah, but I, I really like that idea. I think that of um, proficiency testing and even for that particular case, I mean, that's going to be the most relevant. So yeah, it's a great suggestion. That's also really good, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, I, I also really like that idea. Have some sort of experts or the, at what your top level expertise and do a comparison for the particular uh, examiner. Yeah, 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 there, there is proficiency testing, but it's it's not public and it's, well, anyway, there, I, I won't talk about anything specific because I might be uh, an expert witness. But, um, uh, let's see, I think Tom Lewis uh, has a question and then and Avi. Can, I, can people hear me? Or at least can Michael hear me? Okay. So excellent talk, Michael. It does look like you deserve to have been promoted to full professor. So that's great. Thank and you. Thank you, Tom. Are your almost free lunches in the clinical trial set, are they really more reduced price in the sense that there's an issue of model validity, for example, for the covariate adjustments, or in fact, from the criterion you're using for deciding something's a good attribute to be using to load up on a treatment A or treatment B. So I'm not asking for technical things, but is it a little less rosy than you think, or is it about as rosy as you produced? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's something I didn't mention I got a, I got initially in the talk, but all the methods that we recommend um, and, and work on, they're all completely robust to model misspecification. So if you have, a, for example, our methods that use logistic regression models, where you regress the outcome in a trial and a treatment indicator and also baseline variables, all the methods are, um, they give weak guarantees of things like consistency, um, which gets you accurate confidence intervals. Um, and the, it's all guaranteed with under no model assumptions. Uh, so the model could be arbitrarily misspecified. Still, you get you get the same guarantees you get with the unadjusted estimator, which ignores baseline variables. It's the more common estimator. So and it's actually in the FDA draft guidance in 2021, they say that you know that that's the ideal or it, they recommend, you know, if you can have methods that are robust to model misspecification, um, that, that's much better. And so, it, uh, yeah, so in that sense, it is, to go back to, to your question, it is a free lunch. It's not a reduced price lunch in that sense. You don't have to make any additional assumptions, such as model assumptions. The, the reason I say almost free lunch in that case is that essentially the worst thing that could happen would be you, you adjust, you pre plan you're going to adjust for some baseline variables say four or five variables, and it turns out they're completely independent of the outcome. They're not predictive at all. They're useless. Um, and in that case, you will lose a little bit. So as you add a few more degrees of freedom, you're going to lose a little bit. It's equivalent. Each added degree of freedom that you waste in that sense is like throwing away one participant from your trial. So, but if you're in, but the trade-off is that, okay, so you have a 200 or say you have a thousand person trial for four or five variables, you know, using, reducing your precision by, um, in, in the worst case that those variables are independent, they don't tell you anything. You know, it's, it's a very tiny loss in precision, uh, less than 1% uh, versus some of the potential improvements that you can get. 5, 10, 25%. It's, things are in a pretty good direction. And especially if you have large trials. That's actually the, 
there's something counterintuitive that I love about this, that it's in large trials where you're getting the most bang for your buck out of covariate adjustment in terms of reducing the sample size. Cut your sample size by 10%. That's better in a thousand person trial or more impactful than in a hundred person trial. Um, and that percentage, you might think, oh, but does it go away with larger sample size? It doesn't. That's the... But you might think that randomization would do a better job and you wouldn't have to worry about chance analysis in large trials. It does do a better job in large trials, but you still benefit, the benefit is still is big in larger trials. So I've sometimes heard, I heard a COVID trial uh, investigator say once that, yeah, we're not good. At, we have a huge trial. We don't need to adjust. I'm like, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, anyways, but, but yeah, but yeah, it, but there, yeah, it, there is a potential, especially in smaller size trials. That's where you have to be careful. And there, but there are techniques you could use there as well. So, yeah, but good, good question, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. I think Abby, did you have? Yeah, great job, Michael. Uh, and I think we'll follow up. So both of Jibran's question and Avi's question about can you can you use some automated methods are, are both very good questions in the sense that they, so they, that is people are doing it um, or they're, they're like they, there have been studies uh, there are paper I think it might even be this paper that I'm citing here where they look at they compare people who are doing the comparisons and so they compare it to to machine learning algorithms. That you know, you see did lots of examples of this and see how well it does. And they tend to do similarly, you know, training. Um, and sometimes and there are there is potential for learning a person doing it to learn from what the algorithm says. So yeah, they, exactly, exactly. I mean that yep, that's exactly what um is being done. And they and I realized I wanted to in the last bit of time, I just wanted to say one thing, which um I mentioned just at the very end. In terms of our, I was saying that carbon staff uh, are unsung heroes. Um, I just wanted to advocate uh, that in light of um, high inflation rates, especially, uh, that I think we should pay our staff more. Um, so sorry to put the dean on the spot in this situation. You don't have to tell now, but I think we should be paying them more and giving them bigger raises. I mean, they're, you know, everyone's salary is getting eroded by inflation, but it's, it's, all, it's harder if you have lower income. Um, and not just as because we care about, you know, people lives, uh, but also just even if you just cared about self-interest of the institution. And that's my fear. And we're also, yeah, it's a, such a tight labor market, even uh, situation. So even if we were just, we were just selfish, we would, just, you know, of course, that's not the only reason. So I, I just wanted to make that pitch while I have a, a microphone here. <laughs> Well, perhaps that's a good note to say, uh, to end on. Uh, thank you again for a wonderful um, presentation and thanks for all you're doing and continue to do. And we look forward to more lectures from you in the months and years to come. Thank well, you. thank you for the opportunity to, to do all this. And yeah. I, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and, and for listening. Yep. And for those of you online as well, thank you for coming. <laughs>